So, good morning. Um, this talk is called Developing Good Operations Tools, but it really could be called Developing Good Tools. Um, and I stole the If You Build It, They Will Come, for those of you who are too young to remember. Uh, it's a movie called Field of Dreams. Uh, some of us who have no hair or grey hair will remember it's a movie with Kevin Costner and it's about building a, uh, a baseball diamond in uh, the middle of a cornfield. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is either, but it's like cricket, except not as long and boring. <laughs> yeah, I got a boo from Nigel there. So I'm the VP of Engineering at Kickstarter. Um, uh, we basically enable creative projects. You all should know what Kickstarter is. Uh, it's definitely not the tool for building, uh, building systems. Uh, I have enough Kickstart files floating around somewhere that I have nightmares about that. Every time someone says, we kickstarted something, I'm like, Ugh. Um, <laughs> different thing, much more fun. Uh, I used to work at Docker, and before that I worked at Puppet Labs. I think I was employee number, I don't know, I was after Dan, so maybe employee number nine or 10 or something at Puppet Labs. Um, uh, I've been involved in the open source community for a long time, uh, and I have a funny accent. Uh, thankfully, there's a few of us here with funny accents, uh, Nigel and Anthony, for example. I usually tell people if you don't understand something I say, then ask me to repeat it, but I've only got 20 minutes, so talk to me afterwards. <laughs> I'm also writing a book called The Art of Monitoring. There's a website there. This is my only pitch thing, uh, please sign up to the mailing list. It's at like 500 pages at the moment. I might finish it sometime in my lifetime. Um, hopefully, hopefully, maybe. Um, so, uh, who here is a, consider themselves a sysadmin? Anyone consider themselves a developer? Anyone a DevOps person? Anyone like both? Okay. Is anyone the one person, like the network, security, database, devops -y, and Yeah, there's always a few in the audience who are like, I do everything. I work at a university. We have no money. Um, <laughs> so this talk is not about Docker. It's not about a specific tool. Uh, I gave that warning because um, a bunch of people said to me, are you going to talk about how Docker? And I'm like, no, I'm not going to talk about Docker. I'm going to use some examples, uh, Puppet and Docker being amongst them. Uh, but if you're interested in a talk about uh, Docker's roadmap or anything like that, then uh, please go talk to someone else, because um, uh, I don't know. Um, uh, we will see how we go there. So what is it all about? Well, I want to talk about, um, and using primarily as an example, um, I want to talk about you know, what makes a good operational tool. How do you build them? And uh, we thankfully have uh, in the room here people who are a lot smarter at this than I am uh, between the, let's think we've got, Adam Jacob with Luke Keniz is around somewhere, Sean Porter. There's a bunch of people who've written some tools that have ha you know, achieved some traction. You've probably heard of Puppet and Chef, and I think some people have even heard of Sensu. Um, there, are, there are a lot of people in the room who, who probably have some strong opinions about this. Uh, but one of the things I found in my, my career was that, that I often took a tool like Puppet or, or, or like Docker or like Sensu, and I had to basically build scaffolding around it or I had to build some other tool or it had a problem that, that an off-the-shelf tool didn't work for me. Um, and so I ended up sort of building uh, you know, ra everything ranging from tiny scripts up to sort of rather complex full-on applications with uh, uh, GUI front ends and stuff like that. And I, and I assure you, before Bootstrap came along, you did not want me to be your front end engineer. Um, so one of the things I, I discovered as part of that experience was that it's actually not easy to do, right? This, um, this uh, building a tool that works for you is fine, but building a tool that you and someone, your colleagues need to use is actually kind of tricky. Um, and this is sort of my lessons learned from that. So um, I said I'm not going to talk about Docker as a tool, but I'm going to talk a little bit about Docker and, and, and the hype around Docker. And I'll explain sort of why Docker became popular. And there's, a lot of, there's going to be a lot of controversy about some of the statements I'm going to make next, uh, and I'll explain why in a moment. But uh, I think Docker became successful, not anything to do with the actual technology. It came, became successful because it solved a problem people actually had. And there's a lot of critique in the, in the community when Docker first came out that it, 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 was, a, uh, you know, it, was, it was it was not new. Like, containerization has been around forever. And there's some really good examples of if um, some of you may be aware uh, Etsy's had a container deployment pipeline using LXC for, for years and years. Uh, there was lots of other companies out there that, that had things like, uh, you know, who had used previous iterations, uh, Sun and IBM both sold, sold products that were very containerized. Um, but they weren't easy to use, they weren't simple. And if you've ever, if you've ever actually had to try and implement LXC and, and, and the tooling around that, uh, it wasn't a topic that, it wasn't a, it wasn't a concept that was overly 
Uh, it didn't make you look popular with a lot of developers if you said to them, here's LXC and a bunch of command line things and maybe a script or two, uh, you now have a containerized uh, continuous integration pipeline. It was not something people did unless they had really smart engineers that worked for them. So the thing I think about Docker that was really interesting and really different was that it was actually something that, that was relatively easy to use. It solved an actual real problem um, and it didn't take a huge amount of cognitive sort of leap to understand why it was useful. And I used to be, able, you know, I, I say to people that I can usually teach someone how to use and, and, and see the value in something like Puppet in about half an hour. For most engineers, um, you know, uh, who are sort of primarily developers, uh, that usually took a couple of hours because they were like, this is not a problem I care about. Like, this is somebody else's problem usually. Why would I worry about this? With Docker, it was really easy for those engineers to go, huh, this is a problem I have right now. Like, it's hard for me to get this code off my machine and stick it somewhere useful. So, okay, I get why you want to do this. All right, and I get how this is going to work, and I get how this is going to, is this going to move forward. Um, all right, I'm on board with this. And I would actually have conversations where it would take, you know, three or four minutes to sort of outline what Docker did, and then a couple of minutes of showing people command line stuff, and people were like nodding along going, I like this. Now, sure enough, several days later, they were like, it doesn't do X. And I'm like, yep, it doesn't. Uh, and that's kind of important too. Because it, it was focused when we first built it on making it easy to adopt and easy to use. It was not designed to do everything in the kitchen sink. So, and on that sort of couple of days later experience, uh, a lot of people you would say to me, Docker is shit because it doesn't do this networking thing. Or Docker is shit because it doesn't do this. And I'd be like, totally, totally, I, I agree. For your particular use case, you know, not good. Terrible, absolutely shocking product. You should definitely not use it. Um, and then I would go off to Solomon Hikes and I would say, Solomon, we've got a customer and they want to have X. And he would go, no. And I'd be like, you didn't even listen to me. It's really critical. They've got this thing. And he would go, no, not going to do it. And I'm like, why not? And he goes, well, because it's not important to the, the core people who want to adopt this product. The people who want to adopt this product are interested in this particular workflow and that's what we're going to focus on. Now, this is, I'm talking about Docker pre 1.0. There's a lot of there's a lot of water under that particular bridge. There's a huge ecosystem around the tool now. But back in the day, I would come back from meetings with people and, and my job at Docker was largely trying to sell the concept to, to companies that were bigger than you know, sort of the, the average sort of devops -y hobbyist adopter. I was talking to people like Goldman Sachs. Uh, and they would go, yep, Docker doesn't integrate with our uh, massive storage array. And I'm like, nope. And they're like, we can't use it then. And I'm like, okay. Um, and then I would sit down with the, their application development teams and their application development teams would go, what? Who cares about the storage array? This allows us to do this, this, and this. And they would have a conversation with the operations team who would come back to them and get me and go, yeah, well, could you put that on the roadmap? But it turns out the application team has already implemented, so we're just going to sort of meander along. Um, and that experience was really sort of mind-blowing for me because I was, all of a sudden I was like, huh. Like all of that stuff over the years where people actually said to me, don't build this and the kitchen sink, actually starts to make a bit more sense. So I realized that this came down to, to a, a really important concept. And the, and the concept that I I'd sort of, uh, I was conscious of but had not probably adopted deep inside uh, was empathy. Uh, even today, I, I, I come across situations where I'm not empathetic to someone's problem. And uh, particularly in the technology space, I'm, hopefully I'm a reasonably nice human. My, I, have a, I, I think I get along with my ex-wife and, and my current partner doesn't think I'm a horrible, too horrible person. But in the technology world, I really struggle to empathise with people's problems. Uh, I'd be like, because their problems came at me in terms of a complaint. Like, this does not work, or I can't do this, or even worse, um, they would come to me, not come to me at all, and they'd sit there and stewing over the issue. Uh, because they were conscious of the fact that in a lot of cases when you come, when a developer particularly comes and talks to uh, an operations person, they're not coming to talk to them to ce celebrate the fact that they've just done this launch, they're coming to talk to them because something was really hard or something was frictionful. So the first thing I said to myself was, okay, let's start putting myself in the shoes of the people that I'm building tools for. And the shoes of the people that have to actually consume the tool I have. And as soon as I started doing that, I realized that all of these things that I thought were mission critical to, to tools like Docker weren't actually mission critical at all. They were nice to haves. They were actually a secondary consideration, something that I actually shouldn't care about on day one because it was only meaningful to me. It was not meaningful to the end user. So the first step in building really good operation tools is ask your customers what hurts. Uh, or as I like to finish this, why they hate you. Um, and this seems like a really simple thing, but it's actually not. So 
all of the operational tools I built probably prior to working in Puppet Labs were really scratching my own itch. Now, every now and again, I would solve someone else's problem at the same time, but I was primarily the customer of my, my tool. And I rarely went and asked, beyond, beyond the fact that I was sort of like, I have a lot of help disk tickets, or I have someone has complaining about this thing, I rarely went and asked them to say, you know, what is, my actual, what is your actual problem? Uh, and as soon as I started turning that around and going, um, I'm the one who works for you, you have a problem, tell me what that is, how can I solve it? I started to look at building tools differently. And I built the, to the, the tools that I, beyond that, or used with that, with an idea that I'm, I was not the customer of my tool. So the second thing I learned was, uh, probably since working at Puppet Labs, that product management's actually a thing, right? Um, I was always a bit skeptical about product managers. Most of the ones I met in the enterprise world came from companies like Oracle and things like that. And they were largely sort of talking in terms of like a, a we'll call it a very marketing-centric approach. Uh, or they were from a big company that was trying to sell me a, a widget, right? And so I was like, this product management thing, I'm a bit skeptical about it. And I started working with people who actually do product management stuff, and I, I'm like, okay, there may be some science to this. Um, and there may be some prior art that I can steal. So the first thing I, I started thinking about after I'm like, you know, what's the problem is like, how about, how do I build a framework that allows me to actually solve this problem in a smart way, that reuses some prior art, that reuses some stuff without me having to invent the wheel? So I started to say, my operations tools are products. I should treat them as products. I should treat them with a life cycle. And good products um, have requirements, they have capabilities, and they have limitations. Uh, these are what I call sort of hard attributes. And this is what I actually write down um, as part of my first step in sort of understanding how this tool is going to work. Obviously not a throwaway script, but something that's going to be used by someone other than me to do something. I usually write down a few things. They're usually dot points that they say, I've asked some people, look what they want, needs to be able to do this, and, it, and, and we need to be conscious of what it doesn't do. I need to share with people, particularly important that I share with people, what it doesn't do. And then this part was really hard for me, and, and this is something that actually Luke Kinney's beat into my head, that design actually matters, right? How many people here, uh, let's say how many people here like using said? How many people have to use said? Yeah. So, um, uh, I'm a big fan of, of, of tools that, that make my life easier. Uh, I'm not so much a fan of some of their interfaces. And this thing here uh, is the big step you have to learn uh, in order to understand that, that uh, the things that you will put up with as a user, the things that most sysadmins will put up with as, as kind of interface kind of sucks but I still have to use it, is very different from what people out there will have to, out, out in your community, your customers will put up with. I gave a talk uh, a few years ago I oh, know, last year, I think, uh, to a bunch of front-end engineers about, about Docker. And uh, they literally were like, I have to go to the command line. Um, and, and that would stop dead. Like, they had no, they were like, I don't know how to deal with this. This is really hard. And I'm like, I had some basic assumption that surely they would be able to sort of grok this. And I realized, they don't have to grok this. That's not their job. So I need to build something that allows that people, those people to actually be able to understand this and use this and the way that that is, is to think about design, to think about UX and UI, and most importantly, to think about a user experience that's actually enjoyable and, and good to look at. Like, if you're going to build a GUI, think about how it's going to be used. So, I write up a product spec, and this is usually, could be something as simple, this is usually my initial readme. Like, the readme file and the thing, usually something looks like the product spec. Um, and this is also kind of a, an actual contract I can refer back to and say, my customers want this thing, uh, I built this thing, okay, does it match what I promised to build? User research. User research is really important. It works. Go and talk to the customer after you've established their actual problem. Sit down with them, work through their problem, look at their workflow, understand what the actual issue is. Um, and don't just walk away with, I have a help to stick it. They want a widget. Go and ask them how the widget should work because they're the people that have to do this every single day. Um, this is actually something that I think a lot of organizations do really poorly, both sort of application development shops and tool shops, but it's really easy. It's really simple. You can even, if you don't want to talk to people, make a survey, like a, a, a five question survey. Like I guarantee you that you will get solid, useful data. Um, try everything yourself. This is a picture of Gary Larissa uh, in, in, a, in a, I think it's a, it's a onesie. Um, <laughs> 
Gary has some interesting fashion choices. I, 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 I admire Gary's fashion choices greatly. I couldn't achieve the same thing. But um, try everything yourself. So if you build a tool, uh, actually try it out yourself. Sit down with the people that have to use it and go, I built this, here it is. Instead of just throwing it over the fence, sit down with them and work through, like here is, here is V01. Work through the, with them all of the steps required to actually get this to operate. And understand exactly what their sort of experience of going through it is. Because assumption is the mother of all fuck ups. And as I said, I gave that talk uh, to a bunch of front end engineers. I assumed they had a basic knowledge. Most of them did not know what virtualization was. Like, I have conversations with people where I make an assumption about the fact that uh, you know, they know something about, about my domain that I just assume is normal. Uh, I, I, got, I talked to someone this morning about an example of the, one of the very first puppet trainings that was run. Uh, I can't remember, it might have been Dan or it might have been Gary, called me to say, I have three de Department of Defense, I mean, I'm uh, US government employees uh, present who don't know how to open up an editor. They have never used the command line. How do we teach them puppet? And I'm like, crap. I never thought that of that. that. And literally, we were doing a crash course in Unix Operations 101 at the same time as we were trying to teach them how to use Puppet. Uh, that was an assumption that I just made when I wrote the training materials, uh, I helped write the training materials and helped talk to people, was that uh, you know, that was an actual you know, a, a base understanding. And when I sat down to actually write the Docker training materials, uh, a bunch of the people I was working with said, this is really easy one-on-one stuff, what, why is it all of this stuff here? And I'm like, because we have to write for the lowest common denominator. We can't assume that someone else will understand, my, understand our domain the same way we do. Um, and that sort of stuff is really critical. Build small and iterate. I think this is a really simple lesson. Uh, don't, like, don't build this massive monolithic tool uh, or even this massive like, distributed tool. Uh, build something small. Ask someone if they can use it. Ask someone how it works. Ask someone how the user experience of it is. And then go back and refine that. The more you build, the more you invest up front without asking those questions, the more likely you are to present a finished solution. And I know how tempting it is. Like, I'm going to lock myself in a room for five days. I'm going to build this amazing thing. And then present it to people. And they're like, huh? Um, that is a really easy trap to walk into. Build a little thing that's actually the, the smallest usable component. Like, a, you know, if you're from the product world, we call minimum viable product. And actually make sure that that works. And then build the next thing. Because the learning you're going to get from that is going to be really powerful and useful. Learn when to say no. Um, often, uh, this is a really hard balance to walk. It's like sometimes, and I've just said, you know, user research is useful. Sometimes somebody will say, a customer of yours will say, I want the thing. And you go, OK, that seems reasonable. I'll build that. But it turns out that, that the thing they want isn't actually uh, what they want, or it's not the right thing. You need to strike this balance where you need to go, OK, tell me about this problem. OK, let's break this problem into little pieces. OK, let me solve the first two pieces of this little puzzle and then ask you how you find that. OK, turns out that's not the problem you had. This other problem over here or this other group over here is the issue. So build things simply. Learn how to say no. Learn how to say, OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build you a, a simple tool that allows you to get started really quickly without ending up sort of deep in the weeds. Usability matters. This is uh, the number of times that I look at a GitHub repo with a tool in it that I want to sort of use or consume or add something to my, it has no documentation. Uh, it has no definition of its API. Uh, it has no integration instructions. It has no sort of SDK style things. Um, all of those tools means that you have a really steep learning curve in order to use them and to share them with someone else. So it's really important that as much time as you spend writing code, that you write documentation if you're publishing an API, publish a spec for the API. Actually, you know, a lot of cases, uh, I think this is a, an example from Amazon, everyone who builds an API at Amazon has to build a client for that API. They ship with a client that actually consumes the API. That's a really good start, start to, a point to start from. Um, marketing matters. Uh, if you're gonna sell this tool to people, again, the approach of like, I built something and throw it to the fence does not work. Uh, build a good looking site. Uh, one of the things that I, example I use here is HashiCorp. Uh, I, I don't necessarily like all of the tools that Mitchell builds, but fuck, they're pretty, aren't they? Um, <laughs> and the site's usually really solid, has really great documentation, it has a really great understanding of this is how the API works. This is some real use case examples. They include good videos, really real life examples. 
when I first looked at the, I think it was probably the Vagrant site when that first came out, I was like, I get this, this is really useful. And then I watched a, a video that Mitchell had, had put on the site, I think it was a video, um, and I was like, okay, I could actually not only get this, I could probably give this to, to an engineer right now and they would not have a steep learning curve to get this going. Um, this stuff makes it really easy. And the thing I think about this is it saves you a lot of pain. For every time you do some solid documentation, some good looking docu docs, some good life, real life examples, good videos is one less help desk ticket or one less frustrated call or one less piece of friction in you deploying the tool. The last thing I'll sort of talk about is life cycle. I talked about adopting sort of product management and prior art. Um, one thing about this is don't treat this as a one shot thing. Like if you build something and throw it to the fence and never come back to it, it will not be a successful tool. You have to treat this like a product. You have to care about the feedback you get. You have to care about the help desk tickets people open and you have to actually fix their bugs. Like I, I see a lot of people publishing open source tools on, on GitHub and I see a thousand open issues and 16 pull requests and the organization is, is running a version of that particular tool I published maybe two generations later and they haven't had time to actually address any feedback. If you're giving that tool to somebody, if you're giving that tool to customers both internal and external, you are making a contract with those customers that you will help them out, that you will fix their problems and you will actually support this tool. This is not a one-off sol solve of the problem. This is a commitment you're making to your customers. Uh, and lastly, I'll wrap up with uh, you are not the customer of your operations tools. As much as they may feel like something you've built that may solve your problems, you are not the customer of operations tools. The operations tools, uh, the customer of those operations tools is the people you work with and the people you work for. Questions? Um, I'm conscious of the fact that I'm probably a little bit over time. I do apologise, I misread the time on the thing. I thought I had 40 minutes, not 20 minutes. So this is a bit rushed. You can find James back there or at Powell's to ask him all <laughs> the questions you want. <laughs> um, so we do need to uh, bring up the next speaker. Uh, Sean, if you could come up. A big round of applause for James.